Okay, so I am moving past a couple things that were in the last lecture, so a reminder, pick up the last, go, go check Colab for the most recent posted version of the lecture. Right, so last time, I've just decided to punt on a couple of topics in Coevolution because I'm not going as fast as I wanted to. Um, I'm not going as fast as I planned. I'm going exactly as fast as I wanted. Okay. All right, so we're, we're moving on to a different topic. This is uh, something that's generally called, oh, let me give you the nice and bold thing. Um, I've heard from a bunch of people that can't make two to three on Monday. I'm going to add, I've got this cleared. I've got another half hour in that same room. So if you got a class at two, you can make that. I'm looking into a Thursday morning slot, but I haven't gotten an answer out of the office yet about the room. So stay tuned. Um, per vote, the new office hour for me Wednesday afternoon is 1 to 2 p.m., not 2 to 3. This week I'm going to do both to give people one last chance to look at their phone to get out So you have that one to two on Wednesday is the new Brittany hour. But this week, old time and new time. Perfectly clear? Okay. Um, so, life history evolution. So the bottom line is life history traits, so I'll define these in a second, they're the same as other traits in most ways. So why do we pay attention to life history traits as a separate subtopic? All the same things should happen. Um, there are two answers. Uh, one is they're just interesting to people. So as a person, most of you would like to live forever and have everything um, until you get older and then you realize you didn't want to live forever after all. Uh, but life history traits are things that have to do with how long you live, when you reproduce, how much investment you put into different, different aspects of making more things and surviving. The second reason that they're really interesting is life history traits are essentially all selected to increase. And you'll see why in a second. So some of the rules become uh, a little different, but maybe more clear. All right. So what's a life history trait? This is a cartoon from, um, I think it's from your text, maybe from another one. These are opossums, lovely, stinky animals. Uh, they don't live a long time. They've become one of the hallmarks of life history evolution research because they live a short period of time and you can do a lot of experiments. Life history traits are, are things that we might call things like schedules. You know, how long are they reliant on mom? How long until they become mature? When do they have their first litter? Do they have a first litter and a second litter? So are they heteroparous or semiparous? Uh, how much energy is put into growth and, reprodu and repair versus right into reproduction? Right? So you can automatically or instantly see these trade-offs, right? It's, people talk about it from the sort of bank account point of view. You've got a set amount of money in your bank account, you can pay your college tuition, or you can buy a car and insure the car. Or maybe if you've got a lot of money, you can do both of those things, and you have to decide whether or not you're going to take a vacation to Bali. Right. So there are trade-offs in a fixed, if you have a zero-sum game, there are going to be trade-offs. The idea in life history is that you've got some amount of resource that evolution is now going to shape and say, all right, you're going to live this long, you're going to reproduce this much now, this much later. And what evolution is trying to do is make an organism that makes the most copies of itself, right? That's the only thing that wins in evolution is more gene copies into the next generation. So it's a pretty simple math. Right? When we do that and we look at those life history traits across all kinds of organisms, we come up with some general rules. And I'm going to give those to you and then we'll talk about them in more detail. But I wanted to summarize them all at once because they, they kind of fit together. And it'll give you the scope to look at these, these theories. So the first is selection is not the same at all life stages. Selection is strong sometimes in life and weak other times in life. Right? And specifically, selection should be really strong at the young life stage and relatively weak at the old life stage. Why? Right? So. It, 
An easy example for this, I think, if it doesn't get too uncomfortable, is to compare your reproductive schedule and my reproductive schedule. So I am older. I have two offspring. Um, they are probably, in a biological sense, reproductive age. Um, we hope that's not realized. Um, yeah. so, they, so I have offspring. I have realized this. My gene copies are already in the next generation. Right? Most of you, not all of you, but probably the vast majority, if we took the average reproductive success of everybody in this room, it's going to be pretty close to zero. Right? So what does that mean for selection? Polar bear comes through the door, eats me, big deal. I've already gotten genes into the next generation. Polar bear eats you guys, nothing. You're a dead end, genetically. So, selection's really strong at the young life stage, the younger life stages, pretty reproductive, relative to old life stages. And this changes the schedule of the way you think about evolution shaping those life stages. And we'll, we'll dwell on that. The second one is that the traits that matter to life history are probably comprised of many different loci, right? There's no magic gene that says you live to 77. It's a lot of genes. It's genes that affect your heart muscles and your enzyme activities and how good your liver is and whether you're in an environment that gets lots of resource and on and on and on. Lots and lots and lots of genes. So when we try to do the math about how evolution is shaping things, works really well with that heritability selection paradigm, the R equals H squared S. Right? The other piece of that is there's a lot of environmental variation that goes into life history. You could take my genome and stick it in a different environment and I would be a totally different phenotype and I would reproduce at a different rate and I would live a different lifetime. So the environment plays a huge role in, in affecting life history. <clears throat> and the third major rule is that trade-offs are key. And I'll show you why we think trade-offs evolve. Like, they're not just a handed down from the sky, but they actually evolve. There's a reason that trade-offs exist, and it, we can understand logically where they come from. So you can make lots of babies young, or you can live a long time, but it's really hard to imagine how an organism does both at the same time. So these are the three general, <coughs> general ideas, okay? All right, so we're actually gonna start at the bottom and kind of work backwards. Um, so evidence of, of trade-offs. Really, it's throughout this whole section, but here's a really simple example. So lots of insects have a polyphenism for wingedness, right? So this is a field cricket. There are some individuals that are born and make wings, well, they metamorphose and make wings. There are other individuals that essentially make no wings. And this is a polyphenism that determines whether or not they disperse. So the individuals that are born uh, metamorphose late in the year usually produce wings, they fly off to a new place. The ones early in the year don't have wings and they stay there. So you can think of this as a, a strategy that helps individuals figure out to move from a crummy environment to a better environment. Well, if you make wings here in kind of bluish green, you make fewer babies over here on the, the Y, so how much energy is put into reproduction. You make fewer babies if you have wings than if you have short wings. And you can feed them a lot, you can feed them a little, uh, if you feed them more, they make more babies, uh, but you still have to trade off. Right? So this line is always a negative slope. There's always a trade-off between how much you put into reproduction and how much you put into this flight budget, you know, the muscles that you need to fly. So there's environmental variation, that's the intercept, but the trade-off is the slope. And you can show this over and over again for all kinds of organisms. You as humans are not absolved of this trade-off. So here are data from, um, a variety of human uh, societies, hunter-gatherer societies. Here's the age of a baby at weaning, five, five years. I don't know why that's determined as weaning in humans, but um, it's, a, it's a constant age, right? Age five, how big is the kid? Uh, what's the fertility rate? How many babies per year, right? 
You plot up all these different uh, human societies, you get a nice trade-off, you can make more babies, or you can make a bigger baby. Right? And we can do this with any mammal, any vertebrate, any invertebrate. We see the same slope, not the same quantitative slope, but the same general pattern. So trade-off, bigger or more. Okay. So you play that trade-off out, and you get this uh, interesting, interesting, there. Um, you get this interesting phenomenon that we think of as aging. And if you get into this, there's a great class that Debbie Roach teaches on aging from, from a variety of different levels. And I'm just going to like give you the highlight. So basically, aging is, is getting old. That sounds kind of tautological. Um, Aging is the idea that an organism lives longer than the time that it produces its maximum amount. So why would evolution shape an organism to live beyond the point at which it makes the most babies? And it happens all the time, right? So here's a flycatcher. Um, on the left, you're looking at plots to show you the age and the number of babies. So at the top, here's a bird. It peaks its reproduction at about three years, and then it kind of falls off and produces half as many at five years. Uh, red deer, the males produce a lot at about 10 years old, and then they live a few more years, and they have pretty low reproduction. Females are a little more even, but they tail off here at, a, at an older age. Fruit flies produce a lot early on. They tail out. They have a long kurtotic tail, but they still, they live a long time and they just kind of dribble out a little bit of reproduction. But evolution should be forking all of its energy into making more gene copies, right? It's what, what's favorite. The gene, the genotype that makes the most babies wins, okay? Here are the, the age plots, survival. In the flycatchers, it's a pretty even distribution, but a little bit of a tail off. So they're living to five years, even though they don't produce that many babies in their form, five, four, and fifth years. Um, the red deer stags, you know, it's pretty rough life for a, for a buck after it's reached its peak. They're kind of, I don't know, they, they look like, um, they look like they should be stuffed somewhere. They're just, they're dying on the hoof. Fruit flies, it's a more even trade-off. But all of this is to say there's this senescence pattern and what we define as senescence up here is this late life decline in reproductive ability. We also think of it in physiological ability, right? Just like, are you fit or not? But really, evolutionarily, senescence is you make the maximum number of babies at every point at which you survive. The answer is no, almost no. Right? So why is that? Selection should oppose that effect and favor organisms that go out with a bang. If I could figure out a way to make every calorie go into making more copies and die at the last possible second with all of my calories into more gene copies, my genotype wins. And yet, over and over again, you find organisms that senesce, that produce lots of kids at one point, and then kind of dribble off. So why senesce? So humans, humans care a lot about that, obviously. So let's see if senescence resonates with you. What is, why is senescence a hard concept for evolutionary biologists to grasp? It's never, never remember that you didn't do this. Super quiet on Monday. You're pretty quiet every day, but Monday is the
Are you sure? Okay, I got most of you. Um, so why is senescence a paradox? So let's let's work backwards. So D, selection should favor genotypes that survive longer than alternative genotypes. Makes sense, but that's not the answer because what's really favored is the most maximum lifetime reproduction. <laughs> B and C were popular answers. Maximize reproduction early in life, maximize longevity. So how is uh, C and D, how are C and D different? C and D are different just because it says over lifetime reproduction, but they're pretty similar. Um, neither B or C is correct, right? Because they're not dealing with the trade-off. Right? So the reason that senescence is paradoxical is because selection favors things that invest all of its energy. Yeah, genotype invests all of its energy in reproduction, not living after reproduction. So the key in this one, I think, is post-reproductive survival. It doesn't do any genotype any good in an evolutionary economic sense to live beyond the point that it makes babies. That's that's what you should take away from that, right? So we're going to try and answer why. Why does it happen anyway? Okay. So there are two, kind of two bins. Um, there are the physiological explanations that are, I think, have an unfortunate name, but they call them rate of living hypotheses. So these are uh, a collection of ideas that essentially say there's like a clock in a cell, and when the clock hits, hits the alarm time, the cell dies, right? And, and that may move up to an organism level, uh, organismal function. You guys know Car Talk, Tom and Ray? Is that, yeah? yeah? So Tom and Ray have this idea about engines, that engines have a certain number of RPMs, and it, uh, when you hit the, the end of, you, when you get to enough RPMs, your engine dies. So if you drive really fast, you burn your engine out faster. This is the Tom and Ray version of this for organisms. You have a certain number of heartbeats or clicks or whatever. When you get to the end, you're done. Right? So this is a physiological constraint. It's just the way that biology works. And we'll look at a couple of, of specific ideas. If that's true, then we should see a relationship between the metabolic rate and aging that we should see essentially the faster we run the engine, the earlier it dies. And the other prediction is that there should be no way that evolution can make an organism live longer. We, we take a tree shrew from Madagascar, or we take a, a bilby from Australia, and we select on them, we can't make it live longer because evolution's already pushed it to the max. The alternatives are, a, a, bunch of evolutionary ideas that um, fall under this, again, bin, the evolutionary theory of aging, they make a couple of other predictions that um, the reason we see aging is that selection acts stronger early in life than late in life, and so we're just kind of left with the stuff that selection didn't weed out, okay? So if that's true, then we should see things like mutations that accumulate late in life. And this is appealing to humans. If you think about old humans, um, which you will someday, uh, old humans have lots of things going wrong, right? You've got Alzheimer's and dementia, and you've got Parkinson's, and you've got a higher incidence of cancer, and, and arthritis, and all these things that, many of which are genetically uh, influenced, if not <coughs> genetically based, that crop up post-reproductive. Maybe that's because selection just doesn't care, it doesn't weed it out. The second prediction is that we should see these things called, patterns called antagonistic pleiotropy that I'll explain in detail, and that's the trade-off between doing it early and living a long time. Okay? So two bins, some, some specifics within those bins. 
All right, so we'll deal first with the physiological period. So this comes, this is a plot or a graph from the text, uh, but it's not, it, I put in some, uh, some road maps or road signs because some of the figures come from different chapters in this section. So you should be able to see them on the slides. Um, the prediction again is that we should see the same rate in all organismal groups. This is a plot of the kcals per gram, how many calories per body size are burned in the lifetime of an organism. If physiology determines the difference in lifespan across lineages, we should see them all line up, right? We should see at the same weight uh, adjusted calorie burning rate. And that's not true, right? Because they come all over the place. We've got things like um, marsupials that have a really slow uh, rate of metabolism. We got things that have higher rates of metabolism like primates and rodents. Bottom line is it doesn't work. Right? So that big pattern we expect if the rate of living hypothesis explains aging doesn't bear out on a phylogenetic sense. That's a real simple way to look at it. <coughs> the other prediction is we shouldn't be able to see any evolution of lifespan because evolution's already pushed it to the max. And yet, if you look at, especially uh, crop improvement and uh, artificial selection studies, we can change lifespan really easily. So this is an experiment with fruit flies where selection increased in just 15 generations. So this is like a semester's worth of fruit flies. You can double the lifespan of a fruit fly. Right? That's pretty remarkable. That means there's a lot of genetic variation out there for increasing lifespan, and yet evolution hasn't done it. This experiment's a little bit misleading because what the experiment really does is select on age of reproduction, not lifespan, and that's important. So what, what this experiment did was take two groups. Fruit flies usually make eggs in about two to five days. Um, the control line is take fruit flies that we produce early. That's an early line. The other one is only let the females that produce eggs at like day 20, or is it day 22 after a collision, let them survive and generate the next generation. So when you select on late reproduction, what happens? They live much longer. So it's not selecting on longevity per se, it's selecting on reproductive age and you'll see how this uh, turns out in the next lecture where we look at that trade-off between when they reproduce and what the mortality schedule is like. But the point is, you can cause the evolution of longer lifetimes. Not a, not a problem. Um, so people have, have worked on specific mechanisms. So the, um, you've probably figured out that there's this sort of spectrum of biology there are the ultimate question people like me and Laura who are interested in why is it like that? And the mechanism is kind of like, yeah, yeah, it's cool to understand the mechanism, but we're not too worried about it. And then at the other end, there's the like, what does this protein do in this cell in this dish? Without questioning the whys. So there's, in the last probably 15 years, there's been a lot of focus on bringing those together under the realm of what we call integrated biology. This is one of the interesting success stories of trying to understand what are the mechanisms that cause cell death or aging at a cell level. And one of the most promising leads is this idea that telomere length has something to do with sort of setting the time bomb for a cell. So telomeres are the end of your chromosomes. Uh, every time a cell divides, a little bit of it degrades off. And so the prediction is that this is sort of a the time bomb. When you run out of telomere, that cell isn't going to be able to reproduce anymore, so it's going to die. And you're not going to have a lineage of those cells anymore. Right? So the prediction is we should see longer telomeres in longer lived organisms. And if we can measure the telomere length, maybe that predicts how long an individual or a species on average will live. It's very appealing. It works pretty well. Um, so this is this is largely a success story for understanding and seeing evidence of this physiological explanation for age. 
So this is work that Britt Heidinger did. She was, uh, she was a graduate student at Indiana when I used to be there. She's at North Dakota State now. She worked on these um, pretty little birds, zebra finches, and asked, are the do the telomeres shorten with age? Yeah. And, and you can see this in almost any organism. As an individual gets older, if you take a cell out and measure its, the telomeres on its chromosomes, your telomeres are getting shorter. So mine are undoubtedly shorter than yours. If you look at that early in life, so you take a baby bird and you measure its telomeres and you look at the ratio of its telomere length and then say, okay, we give them constant environment. Do they live longer if they had longer telomeres? Yeah, they do. It's not a super strong relationship, but it is predictive. The individuals born with longer telomeres can live longer. So this does suggest that there's some sort of physiological aspect of cell biology that causes them to, to have variable age. Okay. Here's another one I dug up last night that I just think is interesting. If you like dogs, dog breeds live different lifespans. Big dogs tend to die young. Um, little yappy dogs, for reasons unclear to me, live forever. Um, so it's an unfortunate reality. Um, <laughs> They have different telomere lengths. The ones that live a long time, uh, sorry, live a long time out here on the right, they have longer telomeres than the ones that live a short time. Right? So these are breeds within a species. Right? Those breeds were generated by artificial selection and breeding to, to mess with the variation within that species. Right? So again, pattern suggests that there's something to it. Uh, problem is, is it breaks down when you go to the next level and ask, what about diversity? What if we say, does this explain the differences in lifespan between dogs and elephants and shrews and marsupials? And then the answer is, is clearly not telomeres. You actually get a negative relationship between the lifespan and the length of the telomere. So for some reason, this thing works within species. It, the telomere length predicts longevity um, at an individual level, but it does not explain it at a phylogenetic level. And there are a couple of companies now that have, have caught on to this, and you can actually go online and send a um, cheap cell swab and get your telomeres measured. And it'll tell you how long you're going to live. I'm sure it's perfect. You'll know for sure. Um, but it's kind of a, you know, somebody's figured out that you want to know how long you're going to live, here's some data, and we'll see if it works. Uh, we'll see if, if they produce those data. So, does physiological explanation work? The jury is kind of out. There's some evidence, but it's not a very good explanation for the diversity of synapses. Okay, so what about the alternative, the why questions or the why explanations, the evolutionary theory? Um, if you see in these artificial selection experiments that selection can make an animal live longer or plant live longer, why doesn't it? And we think the answer is that selection late in life is weaker than it is early in life. So this is, um, I don't want you to dwell on this figure. It's in the text. You can dig into it to get the numerical power of it. But this is a simulation. What the simulation shows you is we're going to take just a reproductive schedule. It says that uh, individuals reproduce first when they're three years old, and they live 15 years old. If you introduce a new mutation into that population that says um, shortens lifespan by 13%, right? so now this is like the difference between humans that live 77 years and humans that live 69 years, and so that's fairly significant. Uh, it only reproduces, uh, sorry, reduces lifetime fitness by like a couple of percent. And you know, these are specific to the numbers that they put in. But the bottom line is you shouldn't see much difference between those two plots because there isn't. The difference is right here, right? Just this tiny reduction. Right? So the point is, it doesn't matter much if you live 77 years or 69 years, or really if you're a human female, if you live more than 50 years, because you're not making many babies after that. 
And so what happens to a human female between 50 and 95 doesn't matter for evolution, we think. Caveat coming, right? So mutations that occur post-reproduction have essentially no selection against them. And that's what we think is driving this senescence. Okay, so if that's true, then we should see lots of bad things in old organisms. And I mentioned all these human diseases that seem to crop up, and we think that part of that is that selection just doesn't work against Parkinson's. Like, why, why would Parkinson's be weeded out of a population? It doesn't affect reproduction, so well, why is it under selection? So how do you figure that out? How do you ask, does mutation are bad mutations expressed more often in old individuals than young individuals? It's a hard experiment to do, which is why this was such an interesting thing that, uh, to test. So this is work that Kim Hughes did at, she's now at Florida State. Um, this was mostly done when she was uh, a postdoc and early faculty member. She said, okay, what do we understand about mutations and recessive effects? So, um, we know that inbreeding, think back to inbreeding, expresses more, exposes recessive homozygotes, right? So we increase homozygosity, so more of the individuals in an inbred population should express bad alleles, recessive alleles. Right? So she inbred flies, and you can now assess how much inbreeding depression there is by comparing the fitness of the inbreds to the fitness of an out. Say, are these better or worse than the outcross population? Well, inbreds are generally worse. And she says, well, is inbreeding depression stronger for young or old individuals? Way stronger for old individuals. So these are the same flies, but you look at the fitness ratio of inbred to outcross. And you find that for young individuals, yeah, they're inbred, there's inbreeding depression, they have about half the fitness. But when you get to these old individuals, they're, like, they're showing up these recessive mutations right away. So the inbreeding depression experiment is a way to ask about the accumulation of these things that express late in life. And sure enough, they express late in life. Okay? <clears throat> so the other prediction is that we should see this trade-off of all this antagonistic pliotropy. This gets a little bit complicated. I'm going to try and explain where it comes from, but I want to give you a little bit of background on it just to make sure we remember the terms, right? So antagonistic means opposing. Pleiotropy, remember, is a locus that controls multiple traits. So pretty much every gene in your body is pleiotropic. Um, the obvious ones are things that make proteins that code for your long bones. The proteins that are expressed in your femur are also expressed in your humerus. Right? So that means you've got correlations between those traits. Right? <coughs> Almost everything is pleiotropic. Right? When we get antagonistic pleiotropy, it means that something that increases one trait decreases the other. Okay? But where does that come from? And it, it's really the direct purview of life history evolution. So what do we have to have? We have to have genes that vary in their effect on these two traits. We have to see that there are some trade-offs that exist, and then I'm going to try and explain to you where those trade-offs come from. I clearly need a new battery. Okay, so first piece, this is just an example of two alleles at a locus that have different effects on, on these two traits. So this is a butterfly. The name of the gene doesn't matter. It's a protein. These are two alleles, the AA and the C. This is how big is your butterfly and how many eggs does it produce? What's important about the graph? One of these alleles here causes a trade-off. More eggs, smaller body. Fewer eggs, larger body. The other allele, no trade-off. Right? So there is allelic variation in whether or not you see the trade-off. Right? Both alleles are pleiotropic. The locus is pleiotropic. But one allele causes a trade-off and the other doesn't. So this is just evidence that this kind of allele is out there. Good? All right. There should be genes that influence longevity and reproduction in the same way. So this is a gene 
People are fascinated with the idea that we can find an immortality gene. Right? There isn't an immortality gene that we found. So this one's called Methuselah. I love gene names. Somebody sits around trying to come up with cute names. Um, this single gene increases the lifespan of this simple fruit fly by 25%. So that means you take the average adult male in North America that lives to 75-ish, and they would live to 100 with just this one allele copy, right? Um, here is, so, sorry, I used males, but this one's females, right? So that's the MM, the homozygote. They live way longer if they have this Methuselah gene. So why isn't the Methuselah, why was the Methuselah gene a mutant that was found in a screen and not something that was found in wild type flies, if this is so great. Well, the answer is, there's a trade-off. Right? So here's Methuselah in gray, here's the wild type. In two different experiments, how many babies did they make? Way fewer babies. Right? So here's your trade-off. Again, a gene that controls longer lifespan than we see in the population, but reduces the, um, the reproductive output. Okay? So why? And that's what I'm going to try and explain. So it's not simply a fact of biology that we have these trade-offs. The trade-offs come from natural selection. Natural selection builds antagonistic biotropes. Right? What's true about life history traits? They're always good to increase. Best organism lives forever and makes an infinite number of babies. Right? So anything that increases your baby production goes up. Anything that makes you live longer and make babies every year goes up, all right? So what's happening is that constant selection should exhaust variation, leaving you with only that negative correlation. And I'll show you the cartoon picture so you can see kind of where that comes from. All right, so here's a plot. These are individuals. Some of them live a long time out here on the right. Some of them make lots of babies up at the top. Some not so long, not so many babies. Not much of a correlation. Who's going to survive? I mean, sorry, who's going to be favored by selection? All the individuals out here who, make, who live a long time, and all the individuals who make the most babies, so this top right is the most favored group, right? So that's your red dots, okay? So selection is going to do that every generation. It's going to take that cloud, it's going to filter it out, it's going to leave you with the top right. So each generation, the thing moves, selection favors more babies, longer life, more babies, longer life, until you start to run out of variation. There aren't too many alleles left that are going to make you older, so the Fusel gene isn't there, or more babies. Right? So selection fixes all the alleles that have a positive effect on one trait and on the other trait. Right? What are the simplest things to fix? The ones that have an independent effect on the two traits by themselves. All the genes that make you have more babies, they fixed a long time ago. All the ones that code for longer life, they fixed a long time ago. What's left? These things that affect both traits. And as we keep pushing that cloud with evolution, you end up at the very end of that distribution until what's left. What's that look like? That's a negative correlation. The variation in the cloud are genes that cause relatively short lifespans, but lots of babies, or long lifespans and fewer babies. So what's left when selection's weeded out or fixed all the good genes is this cloud of variation that trades off. And that's why we think we get antagonistic pleiotropy. That, that it is shaped by selection, and the result is the trade-off in life history traits that we see. Okay, so did that resonate? So here is a question about antagonistic pipeline. See if it works for you. What is necessary for that to work?
like, this is good. You guys get it. All right? And you're pretty quick to it. All right? Clearly, this is the thing, D. You have to have alleles that have opposing effects. They have, they're the, the material <coughs> that evolution works with that leads to that antagonistic pleiotropy. Does that make sense? I mean, this, this is a way clearer answer than maybe any clicker question I've given so far. You guys are on it. OK. All right. So last topic. This one is uh, it's fascinating, I think. Um, and people have just recently really picked it up as a real evolutionary conundrum. Humans aren't just senescent. We don't just senesce. We have a bizarre extreme form of senescence called menopause. And, and I'm going to make the case that we are one of three species that are known that have menopause. Right? So menopause is a long post-reproductive life for females. Females in menopausal species cannot make babies after a certain point in life. So here's a plot of, of uh, probability of having kids. Females drop off at a, between 45 and 50. Right? It depends on the society, but pretty much all humans are in that zone. Males have a probability of having kids that tails off for a long, long time. And, um, I found this last year. This, this is uh, Ramajit, who had his first, fathered his first kid at age 94. We think you know, the record, birth records were not that great in his town. Uh, he had a second kid at age 96, um, after which uh, the newspaper reports have indicated that um, his wife decided she wasn't having any more kids. Um, but anyway, the possibility is there, right? It's low, but males can reproduce for a long, long time. His wife was, I think, 50 at the age of the second kid, all right? If you compare humans to other primates, we're different. This isn't a primate thing, right? Here is the, um, essentially, the age plot on the, the X and the uh, age of last reproduction on the Y. Primates make a very nice, well-behaved, linear relationship. Everybody falls on the line except the poorly behaved humans, which live way longer than they should live. Okay? Do our bodies wear out? No. They, our bodies do pretty well. And well, I don't know. Um, our bodies don't do great after 50, but our, our bodies do okay. If you compare a bunch of physiological functions in human females, they, de they <coughs> degrade, they reduced function, but nothing like fertility, which drops off, basically. So it's not that our bodies just wear out and we can't make babies. There's something about reproduction that's different than cardiac muscle function or kidney function. <coughs> what about other things? Well, there are lots of big mammals that live in social environments, they live with king groups, uh, do they experience senes uh, menopausal senescence? So the candidates are things like pilot whales and elephants, and if you look at these plots, the solid line is fertility, and the dotted line is survivorship, and you can see that there's, there's overlap in the tail, they, they die pretty much to the point at which they quit making babies. So even these long-lived mammals, it's not is something weird about big mammals, they are not going through menopause. What else goes through menopause? Two kinds of finned whales. Orcas, killer whale, and pilot whales, which are kind of an orca-like thing. Right? What's different about those guys? Uh, they live in family groups. They live in extended family groups. They don't have dispersal like, like elephants. Uh, males leave the herd. Right? They disperse and they go find another herd, or they roam around with rogue males. Orcas live in family groups for multiple generations. Humans live in family groups for multiple generations. There's dispersal, but there's not complete dispersal. Sons live with mothers for a long, long time in many societies. So what is true about killer whales and humans? 
Well, one idea is this notion that um, it's called the grandmother effect. That there's something about being an old female that's post-reproductive that helps your offspring make offspring. And that it, it's not just that you're helpful, but it has to be better than making your own kids, right? That's the, the math. If you had as high a reproductive success as an old female, as twice what you could help your kids produce, twice, you would, that math would work out, right? So it would be better to make your own babies unless you can make double what your kids, you can help your kids double their reproduction, okay? So, is that the explanation, or is it just that in humans we live longer than we used to, and in orchids we live long, they live longer than they used to? That essentially the fact that we have 90-year-old humans now is a post-selection artifact, right? So let evolution hasn't caught up. Well, maybe it works with humans, but it doesn't work with orchids. And it probably doesn't even work very well with humans. We know that they've lived, that many societies live past their reproductive age. And here's this grandmother effect, right? So again, grandmother effect is you give up your direct reproduction to increase your indirect reproduction. And uh, I said this, so I'm going to skip past this one. This is the, the age effect. So here's the, the more complicated one. And this is what seems to happen in the workers. So there are two kinds of orchids. Um, there are residents and transients. Transients are the ones that you've seen on the nature channels that attack seals and sea lions. The uh, residents eat salmon, and they live in the Northwest oceans, and they have to know where the salmon migrate. Right? And if, in years where there are fewer salmons, uh, salmons, fewer salmons, there are, it's harder to be a, a resident orchid. So the resident orcas have to know where the salmon go. How do they know? Turns out it's the old mothers that, that have the memory of where the, or the salmon live. So an orca male is likely to die before age 30 if mom didn't stick around. If mom sticks around, that male has eight to 14 times the survival probability. That's pretty staggering just because there's an old female with wisdom. Um, this is a plot. What's going on? These post-reproductive females are leaders in the group, and they actually take the, the pod to the places where salmon are congregating in lean years. Who follows them? Daughters or sons? Wow, what's that? It's the sons. So the leaders are these post-reproductive females who follows the males. That's how they're getting the, that fitness trade. -off. And there was, I don't have time, I guess, but the, there was a paper that came out last month, two months ago, that shows their effects on females as well. That female, young females compete and outcompete with the older females. So older females get higher fitness by helping the next generation because they aren't making this much of an option. All right, okay. More life than three next time.